Hello, beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today I'm here to wrap up the books that I read in the second half of July. All right, so I'm hoping that this wrap up will be a little bit short and sweet. I do have eight books to talk to you about today, but three of them I'm not going to say much about because I did a vlog reading these books and then a couple of them are sequels and I really can't say much about. So hopefully we'll be able to get this done in a reasonable amount of time. So starting with these first three, the ones that I'm not going to say much about because like I said, I do have a vlog coming out. That vlog will be up before this video. The vlog was a Christmas in July themed reading vlog where I read some holiday romances during the month of July. This is primarily because I bought a lot of holiday romances last year during the Christmas season and I read absolutely none of them so they are still sitting on my shelves and I don't anticipate getting to all of them this coming holiday season either. So I thought it would be fun to do a kind of Christmas in July themed reading vlog reading a few of them. So if you are interested in hearing more of my thoughts on these books please be sure to go ahead and check out that vlog which I will be sure to link down below. The very first book that I read for that vlog was A Very Merry Bromance by Alyssa K. Adams. This is actually the fifth book in the Bromance book club series. Have I read books two, three, and four? No but I did jump into this and they're really companion books you don't really need to read one before the other. You will certainly miss a few things if you just jump right into this one because there are relationships that are formed in those other books that you won't be familiar with if you read this but you can still read them in any order that you want basically. The Bromance Book Club series is about a bunch of guys who get together and read romance books. This is in kind of an effort to strengthen their relationships so they can kind of better understand women. Ultimately I ended up very much enjoying this one and I gave it four stars. Next for that vlog I read The Matzo Ball by G Melter. This was okay overall. I had a lot of issues with it. Definitely an insta love type of story which I didn't appreciate. In the end I only gave this a three stars. And then the final book that I read for that vlog was One Last Gift by Emily Stone. This was definitely the hardest hitting of the stories and it was definitely my favorite of the three that I read. I also gave this a solid four stars and I would certainly be willing to read more from Emily Stone in the future. The first non-Christmas book that I read in the second half of July was The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. Y'all this was a chunker. I was not expecting this to be nearly as long as it was. I believe it was about 650 pages so this was definitely quite the beast to tackle but it was a phenomenal story. So this is set in two timelines. It starts in 1940 and the present in this time was actually 1947. So you have 1940 and 1947 after the war and ultimately it follows three very different women, Osla, Mab, and Beth, who all heed the call to become code breakers for England. So basically they are intercepting German messages and they are decoding them in order to kind of thwart Nazi efforts during the war. And like I said, all three of these women are extremely different. Osla is definitely very much the wealthy privileged socialite. She is tired of being what was known during that time as a dizzy deb. She doesn't want to just be known as this ditzy socialite. She wants to prove herself and she wants to help the war effort, especially since she is fluent in German. So when she receives the offer to go to Bletchley Park and be a translator of decoded German messages, she decides to go ahead and go for it. While she's on the train headed to Bletchley Park, she meets Mab. And Mab is certainly different from Osla in that she is a product of London poverty. She has a larger family. Her family didn't really have much growing up. She's definitely rough around the edges, but she is going to be going to Bletchley Park and working some of the code breaking machines. Then you're following Beth in. She goes by Beth in this story. Basically, Beth is this very quiet, shy, timid spinster. She's only 24 in this book, but that was definitely spinster age. She is not married. She's definitely several years older than Osla and Mab. And she's kind of under the thumb of her domineering, strict, very, very religious mother. And Osla and Mab meet Beth because they are going to be staying with Beth and Beth's mother and father during this time. So they are basically living there during their time at Bletchley Park and they meet Beth and they see incredible potential in Beth especially because she's a whiz at crosswords. So they bring Beth to the attention of Bletchley Park and she soon is kind of pulled in as well. And all three women really find themselves during this time as code breakers. They find meaning, they find purpose, they find that they are very much greatly impacting the war and they are both kind of also developing their own individual relationships at this time. And oddly enough that's what I really really loved the most about this story was watching their individual relationships. I thought they were all beautiful beautiful in their own way, even though they were definitely flawed. And I really rooted for all of them, but there was certainly tragedy attached to these relationships as well. But I was connected to each of the women and their relationships, and I loved watching them develop as code breakers during the war and really coming to find out who they are and their purpose. Now, by 1947, obviously the war is over and the relationship between these women is very, very different. In fact, Beth for the past couple of years has been locked up in a mental institution. All three of the women are very estranged from each other. But then one day Beth reaches 
out and says, you guys owe me, I need your help. And that present day timeline goes from there as the women go to see Beth, find out what's going on because Beth says that there was a traitor at Bletchley Park and she knows who it is. So in the present day, Osla and Mav are going to reunite to see what they can do for Beth. And you're finding out if there was a traitor, who that traitor was, why there was a traitor and all of that good stuff. Like I said, this was a very, very thick historical fiction, but it was extremely well written and it did not feel this long. I thought it was very well developed. Like I said, you get a lot of each individual girl. You get to learn about them and their personality and who they are. You get to root for them and their relationships and you fall in love with the people that they're in love with as well. And I was just incredibly astonished by how beautiful this story was. I ended up giving this a 4.5 and Kate Quinn has certainly solidified herself as an autobi historical fiction author going forward. I do have the diamond eye on my shelves and I am so excited to get to that at some point in the near future. Another phenomenal read that I had in the month of July, A Blizzard of Polar Bears by Alice Henderson. Y'all know how I felt about A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. I read that last year and it instantly became one of my favorite wintry isolation thrillers of all time. Follows our main character, Dr. Alex Carter. She is a wildlife biologist. At the time, at the start of the book, she has been living in Boston for a while. She moved there for a relationship. It's not working out. She's not really happy there. She misses being out in the field in nature. That's where she really belongs. And she's given the opportunity to move to Montana for the winter to study wolverines on this nature preserve. And once she gets out there, some very sinister and dangerous things start to happen as people are not really happy with her presence. They don't want this land saved or the wolverine saved. And so they are going to do everything that they possibly can to get their way, even if it means taking Dr. Carter out of the picture. And so it's really about her survival story. This follows Alex Carter as she's on to her next study. She's going to be going to the Canadian Arctic to study polar bears because of course the plight of the polar bears, especially in today's day and age, is very, very serious, especially with climate change. Polar bears are becoming increasingly more endangered because of the lack of the ice that they have that they need to hunt on. Like they stand on ice and they they fish from it basically. And now that summers are longer and hotter and they're arriving sooner, they just don't have the ability to survive. And so Dr. Alex Carter is going to the Canadian Arctic to do a study on polar bears, but similar to what happened in Montana, there are people who do not want this study to take place. There are a lot bigger implications in this matter with regard to polar bears, you know, especially when it comes to like big oil and the impact on their environment and things like that. So there are definitely people trying to sabotage the study, but there is also something additional going on in terms of kind of a treasure hunt. So as you can imagine, this book was extremely fast paced. It was certainly high stakes. And I always consider these books extra high stakes because there are animal lives involved. And so this was a story that from the very beginning basically felt very intense, very fast paced, very high stakes. I was on the edge of my seat for a lot of it. This is a true wintry isolation thriller because Dr. Alex Carter is in the middle of the Canadian Arctic. Literally everything about this just felt so incredibly tense. And again, this has now like moved up the ranks and is also right up there with No Exit and A Solitude of Wolverines as one of my favorite wintry isolation thrillers of all time. Now, of course, some of the circumstances in this story were very over the top, which is what made for the high octane reading experience. And I do have the same complaint in this story as I did about The Solitude of Wolverines and that Alex Carter has a lot of skills that you wouldn't necessarily normally expect a wildlife biologist to have. And of course, these skills, like these survival skills definitely come in handy during these stories. But you know, it is what it is. It's just part of the story and you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. But overall, I think Alice Henderson just does these stories so incredibly well. And I certainly love all of the educational aspects to these stories and the awareness that Alice Henderson puts into her books, especially regarding anthropogenic causes or climate change and the plights of animals and how what we do as humans deeply, deeply affects the lives and survivalhood of these animals. And she does it in the story without feeling preachy. Like you don't read these books and feel like you're being preached at. It's all a natural part of the story because of Dr. Alex Carter's career as a wildlife biologist. And there was one particular section in the story. And I want to read to you the quote really quick because it deeply resonated with me. Alex Carter is kind of telling somebody about why she became a wildlife biologist and how she struggles. And she says, there are so many battles to fight. I wrestle sometimes with how insurmountable it all feels. When I was a kid, I thought one person could make a difference, that I could take my sheer power of will and go out into the world and make people listen, make governments create protective legislation. The battle is so much harder than I ever could have imagined. And while some people are out there fighting the good fight, many others who do care feel paralyzed by a lack of hope and don't do anything. And that just makes me feel like I have to work 10 times harder to make up for the people who are depressed into inaction. Not to mention the people who simply don't care at all. And there are a hell of a lot of those out there. And that is like a weight that I feel. And a lot of people, they are ignorant to it. And because they don't know, they can't care. Or they do know and they don't care. And they don't want to know. And so they don't care. And there are far more people out there like that than people like me. And it's really discouraging. And so I definitely resonate with these stories a whole lot. And even if you don't share the same values as I do, I still think that you are going to get a fantastic thriller suspense experience from Alice Henderson's books. So if you are interested, if these sound good to you, please, please, please check out these books. So A Blizzard of Polar Bears was 
was actually the very final book on my official July TBR. And I still had several days of reading left. So I ultimately ended up picking up a book from my August TBR. It was the next book in the Tracy Crosswhite series by Robert Dugoni called Close to Home. And because it didn't really satisfy any prompts for my TBR game or the readathons that I'm participating in, I felt kind of okay going ahead and jumping into my August TBR with this book. And it's just one less that I have to read in August and it allows me a little bit more flexibility for the readathon that I don't know what the prompts are yet. So I'm really not going to say too terribly much about it, not just because it's a sequel, because honestly, I don't really feel like you need to read these books in any type of order in order to understand them. But really, they are just detective fiction and I don't have a whole heck of a lot to say about them. This follows our main character, Detective Tracy Crosswhite. She is a Seattle police detective and it is about her as she's solving vicious, heinous crimes. And it, of course, also follows like some of her personal life as well. Even though I'm moving very far away from detective fiction, I still keep coming back to the Tracy Crosswhite series just because I feel like they are so very well written. I enjoy Robert Dugoni's ability to craft a story. In this story, Tracy is called to investigate the hit and run death of a 12 year old boy. And that hit and run actually leads to a much wider and larger crime that had nothing to do with the boy, but it was kind of the reason why the boy was hit and no police were called at the time. So again, I just find that these books are pretty well crafted, well woven. Now I will say that this ended on a way that I didn't necessarily love. Ultimately the overall story before that was good and I gave it a four stars. All right. And then because I finished Close to Home within two days and I still had several days before the end of the month, I ended up going ahead and picking up The Good Life by A.R. Torrey. I had this on my radar for 2023 because it satisfies a couple of challenge prompts for me and I wanted to read more by A.R. Torrey after reading one of her previous stories. So this story is told from three perspectives but the overarching story revolves around a serial killer known as the B.H. Killer and this is a killer who targets young teenage boys. They are typically very wealthy privileged young men. They are the type of arrogant and cocky guys that would typically be bullies. So this guy obviously had some kind of like history with these kind of guys and at the start of the story he has brutally murdered 16 so far. He typically holds them for like seven or eight weeks and then they are found with very horrific mutilation done to them. And a seventh boy has been taken. He has been gone for several weeks at this point and at the start of the story you see him finding his way back home. And so one of the perspectives is actually this boy's mother. And so you're following her as of course she's very grateful and happy to have her son home but she knows that her son is lying about what happened to him. So you're following her as her son is doing some pretty weird and suspicious things and she's trying to get to the bottom of that. But I feel like that was a very minor perspective in comparison to the main character of the story who is Dr. Gwen Moore. She is a psychiatrist who actually specializes in violent or potentially violent people. These are people that at the very least have very dark murderous fantasies. They want to kill somebody for specific reasons and she is their psychiatrist and she is trying to help them work past these feelings. But she is basically a specialist on killers or potential killers. So naturally her client list is very, very dark. And then one day she is approached by Robert Cavan. Robert Cavan is a defense attorney. Not only is he a defense attorney, but his son was one of the BH serial killers victims. And he just happens to be somebody that Gwen met like in a bar one day and had a passionate one night stand with. And after waking up with her the next day, he realizes who she is and kind of who her clients were. And he approaches her to do a psychological profile on the BH killer. And the reason is, is because the boy who ended up escaping and returning home from the BH killer, he has fingered his high school English teacher, Randall Thompson, for the crimes. And Robert does not actually believe that Randall Thompson is the killer. And he is so sure of this that he is willing to represent Randall Thompson. And he wants Gwen's input and take on who exactly she thinks the BH killer could be. And then over the course of these investigations, as Gwen is trying to create the psychological profile, as Robert is trying to defend the supposedly guilty man, Gwen and Robert are becoming closer. But as they are, also there's a lot of secrets between them. And Gwen is convinced that Robert is hiding something. And Robert is also convinced that Gwen is hiding something. And so you're really following the trajectory of the story as they are both trying to uncover each other's secrets and what that really means. So in the similar vein to Every Last Secret, which was the other book that I read by A.R. Torrey, this is certainly fast, fun, bingeable, compulsively readable. And I think that it was well put together. I thought it was well crafted. And I really enjoyed the direction that A.R. Torrey took the story. I ended up giving this a four star, but part of me wants to give it a 3.5. And the reason I say that is because the story was so fast paced and bingeable, I don't necessarily know how much of it is going to stick with me, how much I'm going to remember it in a couple of weeks time. I don't really feel like this was a substantial story. And because it was so fast paced, you don't get the opportunity to even try to connect to any of the characters. So I gave it a four stars. It's probably closer to a 3.5, but I still had a great time while reading this. I feel like Air Tori does kind of like dark, morally great protagonists really, really well. That certainly was the case in Every Last Secret and definitely the case in The Good Life. And so I think that she has a lot to offer as an author. 
author, but I don't necessarily remember the details of her books. So we're going to see, but ultimately I'm still very, very glad that I ended up reading this and flying through it and picking it up. So we're going to go ahead and keep it at a four star right now. And it is one that I would recommend. And the last book that I finished in July, I finally finished Tower of Dawn by Sarah J. Mass. This is just the dust jacket because I left the book at work actually. I obviously can't say too terribly much about this story because it is the sixth book in a seven book series, but I can't say that this is Kale's story. A lot of people recommend that you tandem read this and Empire of Storms. I don't think I would have gotten much more out of these stories by tandem reading it. I read Empire of Storms first and I think that was the way to go because in this story Kale is completely separated from all of the other main players in this story and he really doesn't know anything about what's happening with the other players until like the very very end. If you're reading this story second you already have all of the knowledge about what happened and then you get to be there as Kale kind of catches up with you and you definitely don't need to know what's happening with Kale in order to understand what is happening in Empire of Storms. So these can be read completely separately and I totally think that's a valid way to do it especially with how long each of these books are. Like this is a 660 page book and I believe Empire of Storms is pretty close to that. So if you want to tandem read it you're basically going to be reading 1200 pages which can be pretty overwhelming. So I don't necessarily recommend that myself. Ultimately, I will say that I did have a good time with this story. I do believe that it was way too long. I do believe that this could have been cut by around 200 pages and would have still been completely valid and still a worthwhile reading experience. I was very grateful to follow Kale on his journey and for him to kind of have a redemption arc, although I personally don't believe he needed a redemption arc. I always liked Kale. I thought he got a bad rap and I think Mass kind of did him dirty and I didn't really understand people's hatred of him. I thought that this book really did Kale justice and I enjoyed all of the things that kind of come to light in this story. You find out a lot of really important information in the story and so ultimately I thought that it was well done. I just feel like it could have been a lot shorter. So I gave this four stars. It's not my favorite in the series but I certainly do agree that it was necessary to have this story and it is necessary to read it. So do not skip this story if you are reading the series. Definitely go ahead and read this. So like I said four stars and I am now only one book away from finishing the series. I don't know when I'm going to finish the series. I don't know if I'm emotionally ready to finish the series, but I absolutely love this one. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I have finished in the second half of July. I think in total I read or attempted like 16 books, which is probably the largest number of books that I've ever read in a month. And I had a pretty solid reading month. I really enjoyed a lot of the books that I read. So I'm getting better at choosing what I know that I'm going to love. Please comment down below if you have read any of the books that I talked about here today and what your thoughts are, or let me know what books you've read in July. If you made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling very chatty, go ahead and leave me a Christmas tree emoji in honor of the holiday romances that I read for the month of July. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to connect with me on any other platform, I always leave my Goodreads, Instagram, and IG threads listed down below. And I would sure love to chat with you on those other platforms as well. And in terms of booktube, I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I could do. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.